Hello minders. Welcome back to the Mind Watercolor doing a bit of a vlog today. Last week's episode one on the nibs and using drawing nibs for watercolor was a big hit. Funny because I never know which ones of these episodes I do are going to be very very popular but that one was and I got some great questions so we're going to take today to lend a little more detail to this. We're going to answer some of those questions because I thought they were very good. We're going to go into a little more detail about how to break in a nib. I sort of just kind of skated across the surface of that subject. I actually thought I would take this bigger one and then actually go through the process of breaking it in. I actually also got a question about glass pens, whether or not glass pens would work. They absolutely will. So we're going to take a look at them. I actually have two types here and I'll show you uh, both of them, the strengths and weaknesses of both and the biggest difference between them and a nib, a steel nib. So I would like for everyone to welcome into the Mind of Watercolor Studio family, Graham or MG. It goes by either one. Thanks to my patrons. We had a really fun time, had a naming contest. Everybody lended some great ideas. And one of my patrons suggested that he be named after M. Graham, the paint. Graham loved it. I loved it. I even think old Reese here is warming up to it. They're kind of becoming fast friends. So we welcome Graham to Mind Watercolor Studio. So anyway, let's take a look at those nibs and answer a few questions. I'm going to go through the process of actually breaking one of these in. And since I have a couple of these already broken in, I'm going to do this larger one. It's got a nice flexible tip that will probably hold a lot of watercolor. I don't know yet if that slot's going to be too big, whether water will tend to collect in there or not. First of all, let's just put it in the holder and use it right out of the package and I'll show you why this doesn't usually work very well and we're going to use watercolor I hope you can see because I wanted to get my palette and this all in the same shot and I will do a couple close-ups here and there so I'm going to get this close right now I have just one bead put it down here see that's that ball of a bead there's probably oils on here from the manufacturing process it collects nicely in that slot so I'm happy about that but that, that beating up is just not acceptable. You might actually get uh, some dispensing of the watercolor that way, but we can do better. We can do a lot better than that. So the first thing to do, I think, is to clean it and get the oils off of it. Now I want to deal with the flame method first. You will see this recommended in a lot of places. I don't necessarily recommend this unless you know what you're doing, but it does work if you're careful. Uh, the biggest problem with uh, doing the flame method of cleaning the oils or burning the oils off is that you can change the nature of the metal. Make it brittle by overheating it and lose the springiness. So if you want to try this, uh, it, it, it's quick. Give it a second or two to cool after every pass. So just pass it over a few times. Let it cool. A little bit of heat's not going to hurt it. And you mainly only need to be concerned by uh, about where the slot is on up. That's enough. Uh, I, I really don't use this method very often, but I thought I would address it. If you've never done it before, I don't think you should try that. What I usually do when I get a new nib, and it doesn't matter how I'm going to use it, whether it's for ink, what I usually do instead is clean it. Um, this is what I normally use. Uh, this takes ink off once you, uh, you use this as an inker, if you use this as an inker. It will take ink off, but it also makes a good pre-cleaner. This Bombay pen cleaner is really good stuff. I just get a tissue. You can use a cotton ball if you prefer. Let's get an area nice and wet. And just rub it down real good. I rub it down completely. Do a couple times at least. And then I would just rinse it in water. Another great way to clean uh, is just to use uh, isopropyl alcohol like you would have in your bathroom. Same way. I'm not going to do it, but same way. Just get the alcohol on a tissue or a cotton ball and rub it down real good. Let's get in here close. I'm gonna see how we're doing now. You want a good sized bodied brush that, that will give you a nice wash so it's consistent. Oh yeah, see it's improved. I still think it's receding a lot. 
Let's see if it dispenses the watercolor. Yeah, so it could be used at this stage. But if I turn it over, look how much it's beaded up. So I think I can improve on it even further. So for me, this is uh, the second step. This is 400 grit sandpaper. It's fairly fine. Yeah, it will scratch the metal. And I had one uh, commenter mention about the tip. Yeah, be careful with the tip. You don't want to sand a lot of the tip. I mainly just want to sand this area right in here up to the tip. It doesn't do much except just kind of scratch the metal, score the metal. This gives the watercolor something to grip. For watercolor, it's going to be fine. I, w I wouldn't necessarily do this for an inking nib. Uh, you might want to keep this separate as just your watercolor nib. That's what I do. I really have other nibs that I prefer to use for inking anyway. So let's see how we're doing now. A little better. Now I will say that sometimes it just takes time. It's kind of like a palette. The third step that I mentioned and it, this works. I can't tell you why it works, but I get the watercolor almost pasty like. Just we're talking like goopy cream and I coat the nib. In fact, I'm going to rinse out my brush, go back and get mostly uh, just almost pasty watercolor. I've done this several times. It works with ink too. All right, I'm going to set that aside, let it dry, and we'll come back to it. All right, this is dry. All this paint's uh, dry. So we're just going to clean it off. Let's take some water. You can actually dip it in the water like a brush. I'm just going to actually just rub it off. If the same thing happens uh, with a palette. A lot of times is, uh, you get a palette beating up, and you know, you may scrub it down with steel wool or fine sandpaper. Some people use toothpaste. Uh, but once you've tried that, the other thing is just to get thick, heavy paint out there and let it dry. And then eventually when you go back, uh, it doesn't beat up. So it's the same principle. I've got very watery paint now. Mostly water. Still beating up a lot, but it, it always will recede some. What you're trying to avoid is just that ball, and it's still beating up quite a bit, so I probably need some more sandpapering. Let me go ahead and draw with it and see what it does. It's at a point where it could be used now. but I do have a pretty significant beating there. Let's go ahead and sand it some more. I'm gonna get it right in here by this slot and up to the tip really well. Really not gonna wear down the tip, uh, the configuration of the tip, unless you sand for a long, long, long time. Again, this just scores the, the metal, scratches it, gives the paint something to hold on to. I probably wouldn't do this to a fine calligraphy nib, just FYI. You know, I mentioned in the last video that you can use this method with gouache. In fact, I demonstrated it. You won't have nearly a problem with gouache as you have with watercolor. Uh, in fact, if you do mostly gouache, you're probably going to have almost no problem because it's so viscous. That's the problem, is the, is the consistency of the paint, whether it's watery or viscous, which is thicker. Some improvement. See how it lays in there? It's, it recedes a bit. It's, it's sticking in that slot, and that's what uh, I like. That's the most important part.
I can still see it filling that slot so just drawing here just drawing a little tree trunk now while I'm doing this little uh, sketch one of the other questions I'll go ahead and answer now and talk about is when do you use this when's the best time what kind of detail when when in a painting would I use this well it's it's up to you I mean it's totally up to you the the point is is that any place that you can use a fine detail brush you can use this so if you would reach for a spotter or an ultra fine rigger this is something you could do alternatively as you can see you can just draw like you would with pen and ink you can draw first go back and wash over it I'm getting a lot of drawing time out of it too so I have a, a bead here, but uh, it looks like on this particular nib, the most important thing was filling that little key slot. And uh, again, over time using it, it, it beads up and recedes less and less and less and less. So I'm going to put this away now. I think before I do, I'm just going to coat it again with some very thick pasty paint and let that dry on there. Continue the seasoning process. All right, so the other question I got was, what about glass pens? Would glass pens work? Yeah, actually they work very well. Now I have played with glass pens a bit. I've never done a video on it. Um, I, I bought this one first. This was primarily bought to test with masking fluid because I thought these would make great masking fluid pens. This one did not work for that. And the reason being is this, this flutes were so thin and the twist that unless it was very thin, the masking fluid, it didn't flow off of there. That said, it seems to work pretty well for watercolor because of the thinness of the medium. It actually holds in all these little furrows, these little flutes, holds quite a bit. Now the biggest difference is that it doesn't have a flexible tip. So you get a little bit more of a mono weight line. Just draw a branch or something. You can ex express the line a little bit or give a little bit of thick thin but it really has more to do with whether you're drawing on the side of it or on the tip because there's no flex to a glass pen at all. Now a lot of details, uh, that may not matter. May not matter at all. Now the other kind of glass pen I found was this and this has much wider flutes and they go straight down, they don't twist. So this will work with a more viscous ink or watercolor like or gouache for instance it did seem to uh, puddle off the tip a little more as an aside what I did like about this is this did work with masking fluid and something I'm going to test further but in just initial tests but you can see when it, it's filled you see how wide those flutes are I'm still getting a very fine line just really fun to draw with watercolor and all these little intricate grasses you gotta be careful with the droplets though if you jerk your pen like I did I'd get some drops I'm 
just drawing and drawing and drawing I still have a lot of liquid in here but this is a better flow uh, for a different variety of viscous materials from a thicker like gouache to a uh, very watery watercolor. This one is my preference. Um, I just felt like this was more flexible than that one with the very thin twisted uh, flutes. Now another question that was asked is will this scratch the paper? Doesn't it scratch the paper? And I mentioned in the video it does a little bit. Uh, really that's not an issue though because you're drawing lines and so what? So what if it scratches the paper? I mean, uh, the scratch is the line, basically. It scratches the line even more in wet areas. If you're drawing back into an area that you've gotten wet, it will score that paper even more and scratch it. But uh, I, you can use light pressure and barely even scrape it. It really, I don't think, matters. Now look at the little intricate grasses you can get. It just seems to be able to go on forever. Go back in. I'm going to add some Payne's Gray, some, some darker. See what happens. You know, where it's wet, you'll get the little wet and wet effects. Again, you know, don't overthink this. It's just like using a fine brush. Some of these areas are still damp, so it's like softening what I'm putting down. It's, it's really cool. I haven't really experimented with this uh, the way I could, but I think I'm going to do more. I'm planning to do a video on a bird. I have a, a hawk, a picture of a hawk that I took in our backyard. A juvenile red-shouldered hawk that sat on a branch outside our back kitchen window. And uh, as I was doing this demo in the last video, I thought, oh, this would be great for, like, feather detail. Fur, hair. Really not that unique in what it'll do over a brush, but it just kind of puts your mind into a different paradigm when you're thinking of drawing. And some people just, they feel more confident doing certain kinds of rendering uh, with a drawing instrument than they do with a brush. So, well, you can get the same looks exactly with a brush, just a little bit different way of approaching it. All right, thanks everyone. I hope those questions and details were helpful, and we'll see everybody in the next video. Bye-bye.